for those not familiar with Halo, it's a series of first person shooters originally developed by Bungie Studios. The series proved that first person shooters can work well on a console and played a huge role in the FPS boom that gave rise to Call of Duty and online gaming's juggernaut status. Bungie worked on the franchise for a decade making five great games before wanting to move on to new things. In 2010 they announced that they'd be stepping away from the franchise to pursue new projects after the release of the prequel Halo Reach. Microsoft, naturally not wanting to lose its killer app franchise that once held the distinction of fastest selling piece of entertainment of all time, made a deal with Bungie to gain full control of the IP and so 343 Industries, a subsidiary of Microsoft established to oversee multimedia projects of Halo, was turned into the main developer for the series, with some Bungie team members transferring to 343 to continue work on the franchise. What Bungie did with this newfound freedom is... Well, you can't win them all, I guess. Back on the Halo front, the first sign that things were going to get bad was when, as soon as Bungie was out of the picture, Microsoft and 343 announced three new trilogies. The Reclaimer Trilogy of Games, the Forerunner Prequel Novel Trilogy, and the Post-War Novel Trilogy. Bungie had always taken things one step at a time with the odd spin-off projects here and there. So this sudden announcement of nine more Halo stories just sounded like money grubbing. The next sign was Halo Anniversary, a remake of Halo 1. I covered that in a separate review to keep focus on Halo 4 here, but it helps if you watch that to better understand how I saw things as they progressed, as a number of the problems with Anniversary became worse with Halo 4. Now obviously, the transition from one developer to another is always going to be a tricky thing to get right, uh, I understand that. But when you have some people who've been working on this series since 2007 and original Bungie staff members who may have been with the series since it began over a decade ago, when you have people like that working on the game, you expect something a hell of a lot better than this. The game is split into three portions, the campaign, multiplayer and the new Spartan Ops mode. I'll be going into the multiplayer aspects of the game first because that's why most people play Halo. To begin, the game comes on two discs, one for campaign and one for the other modes. Not really sure why they needed two discs when Reach had just one, but let's just go with it for now. So you have two discs, and the way it works is you put in disc two and install the multiplayer. <laughs> Allow me to repeat that. You have to install the multiplayer in a multiplayer focused game. What, what rational thinking person would do that? There's really no reason why they couldn't have put it on a second disc that you can just play it from, you know, like ODST did. And that's not even the worst part. Look how big the multiplayer file is. You install it from the disc in two files, one for each mode, but you can't pick and choose. You need to install both together or none at all. What if you, say, don't have enough hard drive space? Because Microsoft amazingly underestimated how quick hard drive space would be used up in this generation. Or what if you want only one of the two modes? Tough shit, you either remove some stuff to make room for a mode you're going to delete later anyway, or you're stuck with just a campaign. I've never heard anyone complain about this, and that is a fucking disgrace on the fans part. You take a game played primarily for the multiplayer and force players to install it. That is fucked up. How did they ever get away with this? It defies all logic. Not that it matters though, since the multiplayer is fucking terrible. See, I've always preferred Halo multiplayer over, say, Call of Duty because Halo gives you more health so your lives last longer and everyone starts out equal. In Halo 1 to 3, everyone has the same starting weapons while in Reach, everyone has access to the same loadouts. Everyone is equal. New players don't have any disadvantage because they haven't played the game as long as the long running players. Because that kind of thing is bullshit. Then Halo 4 comes and throws all that out the fucking window. You can choose your own custom loadouts with weapons you unlock, so obviously newer players are at an immediate disadvantage. If you had access to all weapons from the start, it wouldn't be so bad. 
but admittedly the player doesn't have to level up to level 99 to get the decent weapons, like in COD, so I'll at least give them credit for that. But why do this at all? Halo multiplayer was great as it was, why would you turn it into COD? When has Halo ever had trouble competing with COD? There was no need to do this. So I can't say anything for the new mode because the multiplayer is terrible and I don't want to subject myself to that crap. What I can say though is that the Spartan armor is garbage. Oh I'll get to the Chief's armor later but I'd like to ask why does the multiplayer Spartan armor look more like the nano suit from fucking Crisis than the traditional Mjolnir armor? And the default visor color is blue now for some reason when it's always been gold. And the gold they do have in the game looks like shite. It's this awful piss yellow that doesn't look good at all. I mean, look at it. I don't fucking get me started on the fact that they dropped elites entirely from the multiplayer, because now you're playing war games. Yes, the multiplayer is no longer just contactless fun, now it's cannon. Smack an opponent off the edge to their death? Cannon. Shoot your mate in the face with a sniper rifle? Cannon. Stab them in the skull with a knife? Cannon. Who asked for this? Who fucking asked for this? Seriously! So in conclusion, the multiplayer is... terrible. It's one of the worst things in the game, but there's plenty more bad to be found as we dive into the campaign. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the series, here's a brief rundown of what happened in the first three installments of the Halo series. By the 26th century, humans have colonised many new worlds, and with such development naturally comes dissent. With terrorist attacks on the rise, Dr. Catherine Halsey devises a plan to create the Ultimate Warriors. She selects 300 children and has them abducted to be raised as soldiers to fight various terrorists and dissenters that normal marines can't deal with. Shortly after the Spartans are first deployed, humanity comes under attack by a collective of alien races known as the Covenant. The Covenant are seeking human artifacts from an ancient civilization known as the Forerunners. The Spartans are deployed to the planet Reach, where the Covenant are attacking. Things go south and Spartan 117, the Master Chief, is believed to be the last surviving Spartan when the Covenant glass the planet. The Chief escapes on a ship called the Pillar of Autumn which crashes onto a ring world called Halo. The Chief, along with his AI companion Cortana, learns that the ring was designed by the Forerunners to wipe out all life in the universe to kill a parasitic race called the Flood. The two destroy the Halo ring, wiping out the Flood and Covenant forces along with it. Six months later, the Chief learns about even more Halo Rings and is forced to work with a disgraced elite called the Arbiter to stop the Covenant's leaders, the Prophets, who wish to activate them to begin their great journey. The Covenant is left divided, with the elites and those who don't want to die on some stupid crusade, insert such al Qaeda joke here, joining the humans, while the remainder stay with the Prophets. The Chief also loses Cortana, who falls into the hands of the Flood's central intelligence, the Grave Mind. Chief and the Arbiter work together to put a stop to the Prophet and recover Cortana from Gravemind's clutches. They then destroy an artificial Halo ring designed to replace the one from the first game. They escape aboard a ship, the Forward into Dawn, but the ship is torn in two and only the half the Arbiter resides in returns to Earth. The war is over and the Arbiter attends a memorial service for those lost to the war. The Chief and Cortana are unaccounted for as their half of the ship heads towards a mysterious planet that remained a mystery for five years until the release of Halo 4. From here, the story picks up four years, seven months and ten days after the events of Halo 3, yes, they're that specific for some reason, where Dr. Halsey is recounting the history of the Spartans. Keep in mind that this is the first time the games have ever mentioned these details for some reason. Now, this cutscene is pre-rendered and it does look amazing, but why do the Spartans resemble the new Halo 4 design instead of the old Halo 1 design? Those not familiar with the series may not notice, but the difference is striking. Also, that brute is way too big, what the fuck is that about? And don't worry, this cutscene will be relevant in Spartan Ops. Not the story that opens with the scene, no, that would be too obvious. In fact, Halsey never appears in the campaign at all beyond this point. It's a real missed opportunity since I'd like to see Halsey and Chief interact some more, especially in light of the events of the original trilogy and the novel she was featured in, and because the two have never interacted in any of the games despite their long history together. After that, we return to the Forward Unto Dawn where a strange orange light appears to scan the ship's interior. We find Cortana awakening the Chief from cryosleep, and we get to look at his new armour. Now, this armour is something that really bugs me. 
is clearly not the same armor he was wearing in Halo 3, and he's not had a chance to upgrade it in the interim, having been adrift in cryosleep for four years. And don't give me any bullshit about Cortana upgrading his suit, she only upgraded the firmware to justify the new HUD. There's no way she could possibly alter his armor, and what it's changed to look like is just horrid. It's way too bulky for one, the Spartans, despite their huge frames and gameplay restrictions, are actually rather agile, as shown in Halo Wars cutscenes and even the intro for this very campaign. But this armor does not suit that agility at all. I'd have much preferred they stick to the previous design or open with the Chief being picked up by another ship and getting the upgrades there. I mean, he does meet up with some humans who do have access to Mjolnir their armor later on. So why not just start with him meeting them or let him keep the Halo 2 and 3 armor until then. As for Cortana, she's had the design overhaul as well. It falls in line with her design being made more, well, sexy with each new appearance. They've darkened her hair to make it stand out more, her face looks less, I don't know, cartoonish I guess, making her look more like a real person. And they added a lot more detail to her body, even going so far as to give her individual toes. I'm not sure this makes sense in the setting, the added detail is nice, but she looks a bit too different, and the change is never acknowledged, so I can only assume her appearance is either being retconned, or she is just able to change the appearance of her avatar at will. So as is usual for Halo games, the player advances through a fairly slow level at the start, gaining weapons slowly so they can get used to them, instead of overloading the player with too much at once. The problem is that the enemies are the Covenant. The war is over. That story is supposed to be done. This is supposed to be the start of a new trilogy that moves on. But I can't complain too much because fighting the Covenant is about the only time the game feels at all fun, or even like a Halo game. Or it would if the weapons weren't so fucking terrible. If you watched my Halo Anniversary review, you're aware that they changed a few sound effects for that game. This game doesn't retain a single classic sound effect other than the shield charge sound and a few for menus and multiplayer. All weapon sounds are replaced, except in the game's CG trailer, strangely enough. False advertising, I guess. And all the new sounds lack any kind of impact. Every fucking weapon sounds terrible and feels not fun to use. It's hard to probably convey how something feels in a game, but suffice to say, the weapons here are underwhelming. Unless it's a precision weapon, like the sniper rifle, DMR or battle rifle, it's not worth using. Even the fabled rocket launcher that I would always rush to when playing previous games feels so pathetic. I see one lying around just ready to be used and I couldn't give less of a fuck if I tried. I'll discuss the new weapons later, but they're even worse than the returning ones. After a while, we reach one of the game's first new mechanics, quick time events. The player has to climb an elevator shaft in first person by pressing the prompts that appear on screen. This is both really boring and really ripped off from Modern Warfare 2. And has any sequence in which the player has to press two buttons in sequence ever been enjoyable? I can't think of a single one. Also, Chief constantly jumping around the shaft here looked idiotic. After a brief, admittedly somewhat enjoyable low gravity segment, the Chief finds that the ship is on a crash course with the planet below and has to reach an escape pod. The whole level just feels like it was copied from the opening levels of Halo 1 and 2. And it's the best level in the game. Yes, the opening level is both completely unoriginal and completely unsurpassed by any other point in the game. I'll let that sink in for a minute. The Chief rides a chunk of debris down to the surface where he awakens in the wreckage. Cortana begins speaking erratically and it becomes clear that this is Cortana's rampancy coming to the forefront. See, smart AIs like Cortana only last seven years, and Cortana has been active for eight. Her activities in the previous games and novels haven't helped either. The Chief is determined to find Halsey to fix Cortana, but she has already accepted that it's inevitable. This scene sets the tone for the whole story, being much more emotional and character focused than previous games, treating Rapunzel like a terminal illness and the Chief like a grieving spouse. See, the idea for this game was to delve more into the Chief's character. The problem is, the Chief doesn't have a character. Really, he's just an avatar for the player to control. He was never anything more than that, even in the novels. He's a machine that gets the job done. It's those around him, Cortana especially, that carry the emotional baggage. If you've ever read Judge Dredd, it's a lot like that. 
Now, I certainly applaud the attempt to tell a more emotional story, but when the character's emotions are supposed to be suppressed to make him a more effective killing machine, it doesn't really work out so well. For an emotion-driven story, you need the protagonist to, you know, emote a lot. And Chief just doesn't do that. Anyway, the two proceed along a very beautiful landscape before reaching a bizarre structure. They find a map room and learn that they're on a shield world called Requiem. You're going to learn very quickly that 343 writers have no imagination when it comes to naming things. The Per Reach, the Cathedral, what did I tell you? Where they are attacked by a group of mysterious creatures. They manage to open a portal, yes, an actual portal, and escape. As they attempt to make contact with the UNSC Infinity, Chief is attacked by the new enemies, Prometheans. Aside from having a boring, unoriginal name, their designs are uninspired, and they're not fun to fight. With their sector-like teleport spam bullshit, they're at war with the Covenant, harkening back to the Covenant flood battles in Halo 1. Later on, a large sphere appears, releasing a mysterious being who looks like an alien version of Lord Voldemort. The Covenant and Promethean stop fighting and bow before him while he shows off his telekinetic powers and his massive size. Keep in mind that Chief towers over fully grown men. This is clearly intended to make this guy seem more threatening, but given Chief's own size in armour, this is ludicrous. This is our antagonist, the Didact. Yes, that's actually his name. It sounds more like an artifact than a title, but that's what they call him. The thing is though, Halo has never needed a central antagonist, not really. Halo 1 kinda had Guilty Spark, but the player never fought him and his presence is hardly, if at all, felt during the final couple of stages. Halo 2 had Tartarus and... well, moving on. Halo 3 had three antagonists, but only one is fought by the player, and that was only because Bungie felt that that was the only real way to deal with this character after three games of build-up. Reach and ODST also lacked central villains like this, so having an antagonist introduced so early with the whole plot building up to the final confrontation seems really weird in Halo. You know, that and he's a shit villain. So the Didact, why did they give him such a stupid name? Takes control of the Prometheans and Covenant. He monologues about how he's better than humans or whatever, you know, hackneyed villain monologue number seven, and causes a slip space rupture leading to a vehicle segment. These sections were used as the big finales in Halo 1 and 3, but here it just comes up randomly and feels out of place somehow. The Chief escapes through a portal just in time to see the Infinity crash on the planet, giving him his next objective. The next level is a jungle setting, where the player gains a new Promethean Vision Armor ability. Sacrificing a defensive ability just for an alternate vision mode seems dumb though, so I never use it beyond giving it a try. Chief meets up with the crew of the Infinity, including Commander Lasky and Commander Sarah Palmer, voiced by Jennifer Hale, whose rank and voice give off the impression 343 just wanted to have the female Commander Shepard in the game. Yeah, let's not make our own compelling characters like Bungie did, let's just steal someone else's. No one's gonna notice. Oh, and she's a twat and all. I thought you'd be taller. So these guys are a scouting party trying to discover the origin of the gravity well that's keeping the Infinity on the planet. Naturally, they ask the Chief to clear an LZ for them because this is a shooty shooty bang bang game where only one person has any ability in the entire universe. He does so and they make it back to the ship. Infinity has been studying the Halo rings to try and shut them down for good. An honourable goal. But Captain Del Rio reveals himself to be another hackneyed archetype, the arsehole authority figure who doesn't care if you save the universe twice, you're still beneath him and unworthy of trust. Again, another archetype stolen from Mass Effect. Put some actual effort in, people. He plans to just leave the planet without dealing with the Didact. <sighs> Remember when Halo had... actual characters? And why does he look like Lance Henriksen? It's so random. The captain briefs the troops via hologram, which looks weird with how solid it is. He shows no respect for the chief as he explains that there's been no recon because that's a good idea. Prick. During the mission, chief comes across a forerunner called Librarian, because the forerunners didn't have actual names apparently. I think she's an AI based on the real Librarian or something, it's never really explained. It's probably explained in the novels, but it's not right to leave out details to be explained in other stories. 
She's a Didact's wife for some stupid reason, both character-wise and writing-wise. It just seemed like she's a moron for marrying such an asshole, and the two being married to begin with seemed like such a random thing to include. She explains that the Didact is looking for a device called the Composer, and plans to use it against humanity. Because he hates humans. See, the original humanity. Yeah, see, there's this whole thing in Halo where the Forerunners set up this device to clone all races in the galaxy after the rings were used to wipe them out. And all races, like humans and the Covenant races, they're all descended from those clones, so they're all kind of second wave of those races. And I don't think that was ever explained in the games, only in the anime and possibly the Forerunner books, I don't know. I never read the Forerunner books because Halo 4 kind of drained a lot of my desire to care about this universe. And I don't think they've explained how the Flood survived. Hmm. So the first wave humans fought a war against the Forerunners where the Didact rose to power through military might in suppressing the humans. Humans had been trying to escape the Flood implying it started on Earth I guess. Weakened from the war, the Forerunners were no match. Yeah, adding humanity to the Forerunner Flood backstory just comes out of nowhere and seemed like a forced way of justifying the villain being just some arsehole who hates humanity. Kind of like how Quan Chi was forced into the Scorpion Sub-Zero backstory as a shitty justification for him being the master of both Scorpion and the undead noob Cybot who was the original Sub-Zero. When you have an established backstory people, don't force extra characters in there. It looks fucking stupid and forced. But anyway, the librarian sucks at exposition so the game's plot synopsis on Wikipedia helps out a lot here. Basically the great journey planned by the Forerunners that the Covenant never stopped bumming up was to basically become digital and therefore immortal the Composer is the key to doing this and the Didact used it on humanity to make them immune to flood infestation, becoming the Prometheans. What is it with hack writers and having things relating to Prometheus and humanity's ancient backstory? It's stupid and needs to stop guys. The Didact was in prison which somehow protected him from a galaxy wide genocide wave because that makes sense, and no he's not become digital himself yet. And then they make possibly the stupidest plot decision the franchise has ever known. When I indexed mankind for repopulation, I hid seeds from the didact. Seeds which would lead to an eventuality. Your physical evolution. Your combat skin. Even your ancilla Cortana. You are the culmination of a thousand lifetimes of planning. If that doesn't make any sense to you, allow me to explain. They basically ripped off the overarching story of the Assassin's Creed series to establish this idea that the librarian set up everything to lead to the chief. They are introducing destiny into the Halo universe. I mean, that's fucking moronic and as if that's not bad enough, they actually found a way to make it even dumber within the next 20 seconds. The gene song I placed within you contains many gifts, including an immunity to the composer. But it must be unlocked. How? Relinquish your contact essence. Your evolutionary journey must be accelerated. Can I defeat the Didact without it? No. Then do it. Prepare. Evolution does not work that way, okay? Evolution requires hundreds, thousands of generations to make any significant change and you're telling me that this bitch has the power to just evolve a person at the genetic level just through some technology. This isn't science, it's fucking space magic. What is this, the Mass Effect 3 ending? So after that retarded shite, the Chief takes out the gravity well with help from the Infinity Troops in the only good pulled ship stage, where you move out with a convoy from point to point, and pleads with the Captain to fight the Didact, but of course, Del Rio's character is just a Turian Council member from Mass Effect, who just antagonises the main character despite everything he's done, again, Hackney's right it. I'm not willing to jeopardise my ship because of the hallucinations of an ageing Spartan and his malfunctioning AI. Del Rio is determined to leave, but Cortana freaks out. I will not 
allow you to leave this planet! It should be noted that one of the things people most liked about the campaign was Jen Taylor's performance as Cortana. Honestly, I don't see it. Don't get me wrong, she does a great job, as usual. It's about on par with her other work in the series, and I think it's just because Cortana in this game has less snark and more emotional outbursts and moping. Del Rio demands that Cortana be removed, but Chief won't let him. Del Rio hands out an order to arrest Chief, who leaves the bridge to go after the Didact. Lasky provides Chief with a Pelican dropship, which is something fans have wanted to pilot since Halo 1. Naturally, this being Halo 4, it's not as fun as it should be. Aside from a few enemy dropships to take out, you mainly just fly from point A to point B between ground segments. Lame. Though having a ton of weapons strapped to the side of the Pelican is kinda cool. Power this crate back up. We're just about to the carrier wave generator. Unable to sabotage the Didact's stupid looking ball ship, Chief jumps onto a Covenant ship, clearly inspired by a similar scene in Halo 2. The difference is, that was Earth's upper atmosphere, so the gravity would be weaker, allowing a more reasonable descent speed. Here he just drops and lands within the planet's atmosphere, and he's completely fine. Oh, oh yeah, because he's evolved, right, right, so he sticks to the ship with his knife. Yes, I'm sure a starship with armour designed to withstand space travel, combat, slip space, planetary re-entry and all sorts of other extreme conditions would be vulnerable to a small combat knife. Fuck you! Nah, my kidneys. The ship makes a slip space jump and Chief is fine through it all, riding on top of a ship. I'm beginning to think the enhanced evolution thing was intended to justify these completely impossible feats the Chief can achieve in this game. It turns out the composer has been taken from the local Halo ring to a nearby research station, which the Covenant are now attacking. Cortana goes into a rant of sorts and is too distracted to not crash the ship into the station, which Chief of course survives. Despite Chief's best efforts, the Didact managed to obtain the composer, making the entire level completely redundant. And he uses it on the entire station. <laughs> Christ, this is... This is dark. I mean, I know the novels can get pretty messy, but the games... Fuck. The Chief survived because he's combat evolved and obtains a fighter to go after the Didact, who hasn't jumped to slip space yet. Probably narrative convenience, so the Chief can attach his ship to the Didact in a scene that rips off something, but I'm not entirely sure what. Star Wars, I think. Use the Force, Luke. Let go. The Infinity, now commanded by Lasky because everyone realised El Rio was a cunt, helps Chief get into the Didact ship with a very small nuke the Chief can conveniently keep attached to his arse. Cortana duplicates herself to mess with the Didact's shield to allow Chief to get in close. The Didact begins firing the composer at Earth and the pedestal Cortana is inserted into is destroyed, leaving her fate unknown. Chief makes his way to the Didact who dominates Chief but is too busy gloating to actually kill him, yet another terrible villain trope. He could just drop him here but nope. Then the story finds another way to jump the shark. Cortana's doubles all appear and somehow bind the Didact in place. Chief falls much closer to the bridge than should be possible and then the player has to pull themselves up and tap a button to plant a grenade on the Didact. grenade does not act anything at all like it does in normal gameplay, where it creates an energy field that kills anything called within it. The grenade acts just like a plasma grenade which they could have easily had Chief plant on him, but they're too dumb to think of that. The Didact falls into the beam below, presumably digitising him so he can come back and be just as shit and pathetic in the sequels, possibly in Halo 6 or at the very end of 5 as a plot twist. But let's just put this into perspective here. The entire game has been building up the Didact as the greatest threat to humanity ever, bar none. He is incredibly powerful and beats the shit out of the Chief every time they meet. And at the very end, Cortana holds him in place so the player can press a button and win. 
The big climax this whole game has been building up to is a quick time event. A word to the wise for all aspiring game designers. Unless your game is built around them, do not in any circumstances end your game with a quick time event. But wait, there's still time for one more bit of stupid before the credits roll. The chief detonates a nuke which he somehow survives. No, I'm not kidding. And he finds himself in some weird digital plane or something. And Cortana is now human size. We get an emotional scene that is actually kind of effective. And this is clearly why people praise Jen Taylor's performance in the game, even if Cortana's size makes it difficult to take completely seriously. And the dialogue seemingly implies a romantic interest on Cortana's part, which, if Cortana's mind is based on Dr. Halsey, who met Chief when he was like five to seven years old, what the fuck does that say about her? So Chief displays some emotion for the first time in the games and practically begs Cortana to go with him, but she can't. She says goodbye and Chief is somehow left afloat in space. If not for the nonsensical and slightly paedophilic aspect of the scene, it would be a great emotional moment if it made more sense and involved someone other than the Chief. See, the basic dynamic between Chief and Cortana is much like that between Judge Dredd and any of his major companions, as I said before. He is the stone cold killer machine that gets things done because he was raised to have no emotion while she is the one who carries the majority of the emotional baggage. The two complete each other is what I'm seeing. So the dialogue is fine and Steve Down's performance is as good as it can get with a character who speaks in a very even tone at all times, but the scene doesn't completely work because of the character involved. Halo 5 is set to use this as a jumping off point to have Chief go on a journey of self-discovery and personal reflection after losing Cortana, but I think telling an emotional story about the Chief is just a bad idea. Just to wrap things up, Chief is found by the Infinity, a first for the series as Chief is usually lost at the end of any given title, and Lasky tries to inspire Chief by telling him soldiers and humans aren't two different things, something Chief has heard before, which likely will be used as a catalyst for Halo 5's events. After the credits we see the city that was blasted by the Died Act, where the people have seemingly all been digitised to justify more Prometheans showing up in Halo 5 and 6. We hear the didact in what sounds like him speaking to the other Forerunners before he was sealed away, which is odd that he calls them Forerunners when they're not running for anything else at the time. Chief has his armour removed and the legendary ending is that you see his eyes. Wow, waste of fucking time. And that's it. The campaign is over in no joke about four and a half hours, including an hour of cutscenes. Halo Reach was definitely longer than that, hell, I think ODST is the only one that's shorter, and that was just a side project, not the next big evolution for the franchise. Next. Now we get to the Spartan Ops mode. First, it's a story based co-op campaign. You can play it solo, which is a point in its favour because that's one drop of good in an ocean of bad decisions and design elements. Let's break it all down for simplicity's sake. Number one. The setup is that you enter a map, some based on campaign stages, some taken straight from the multiplayer, and your task is almost universally to just kill everything. That's it. Oh, they'll occasionally throw in an arbitrary objective like, pick this up and take it here, but that's it. Mostly you just fight a shitload of enemies to clear the stage. Now this wouldn't be all that bad except, number two, you can't fail. Now I'm not the kind of person who complains when a game is easy, I honestly think people who do need to be dragged out into the street and shot, but in this mode, dying has zero consequence aside from maybe a point deduction. You can just keep throwing yourself at the enemy until they're worn down and killed. You don't fail if you die, you don't fail if the whole team is dead simultaneously, you have no life limit, no time limit, no one that you need to protect, no sense of urgency or danger whatsoever. Even on higher difficulties there's no added stipulations, all it does is make the enemies take longer to kill and the whole thing becomes even more fucking tedious. I have no problem with games having easy difficulty options, in fact I think that's a good thing, it makes it more accessible for more casual players, and as long as it has the higher difficulties, people with a rod on for a challenge have no right to moan about it. But at least knowing that you can fail, that there are consequences for failure, adds a certain thrill to the proceedings that this mode absolutely lax. But the hell of it is, you don't even have to play it. Number 3. The story and gameplay are separated. 
The story was split into five episodes, ten when you add in related DLC, each consisting of five stages. Episode 1 was available on launch, with the remaining four only being unlocked weekly, which is an immediate red flag for me because that's locking out content on the disc, which is disgusting. Admittedly, you don't have to pay for any of it, Capcom, so it's not all that bad, but I still think they should have just had it all unlocked on launch. That all makes Spartan Ops a standalone episodic game release weekly leading up to Halo 4's release. So you get the five stages as well as a series of pre-rendered cutscenes to explain the plot. Now these cutscenes do not play at the start or end of stages, no. You select them separately from the menu. What's worse is that the gameplay portions are only tangentially related to the cutscenes, which I find makes playing the episode completely redundant when you can just watch the cutscenes instead and miss literally nothing. Like I did for the sake of this review. I'm not going to fucking play through that shit. The story, in case you actually give a shit at this point, goes like this. You are part of a new Spartan team called Crimson Team, serving under Sarah Palmer. And since all the cutscenes are pre-rendered, your Spartan never actually appears, removing the player from the proceedings and being tragically inferior to Halo Reach. And yes, I did say Spartans. The idea is that normal people have become Spartans in the few years since Halo 3, instead of the lifetime of rigorous training that set them apart from Marines and ODSTs. You know, like the actual Spartans the name comes from. While this idea may have worked for that Halo machinima I wanted to make when I was 15, it doesn't really work for an official main storyline, because this means that they rely on the technology of their armour, which is not much better than that of Halo 3. While the original Spartans were their best because they were raised as warriors like their namesakes, just giving someone the armour and calling them Spartans just seems wrong and in-universe disrespectful, especially since most of the 300 candidates are dead by now. Anyway, the cutscenes focus on Majestic Squad instead of the player's Crimson, which makes one wonder why they even bothered with the anonymous Crimson instead of just making Palmer the lead. Granted, Palmer is a boring bad girl stereotype, so a blank slate is a better lead in every way. Anyway, Crimson Team obtains an artifact from Requiem, and it absorbs and teleports a scientist, an event briefly alluded to in the campaign. Then we're finally reintroduced to Dr. Halsey, who on top of creating Spartan 2s, also designed the Infinity, because experts in one field are experts in all, apparently. She's brought in to look into the artifact, and the crew discovers that a Sanghealy terrorist, yes, they actually call him a terrorist, I get the distinct impression that the developers were maybe trying to make some kind of commentary about the way Muslims are treated, what with having this Sankhili being called a terrorist and an earlier reference to Covenant Asylum Seekers. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but if it's not, then it seems like it was really out of place because they didn't really do enough with it, so it just seems like a completely unnecessary and kind of awkward addition. So anyway, this Sankhili elite, he's working for the Didact, and the scientist, Glassman, is being forced to help him. The Spartans recover another artifact that turned out to be an AI with human memories. The terrorist uses the first artifact to communicate with Halsey, leading to her detainment. One of the majestic Spartans, Thorn, then uses the first artifact and encounters the Elites, no other Covenant appearing cutscenes for some reason, ending Season 1 on a cliffhanger. Season 2, and I'll never know why anyone gave enough of a shit for there to be a Season 2, opens with Thorn having been captured by the Elites. Glassman, meanwhile, has awoken the librarian from the campaign and flees. He encounters the elites holding Thorn, giving him the chance to break free. Halsey overrides the ship AI to get access to a terminal and get information on the librarian. She learns about the chief's survival and the ship is attacked by Prometheans. Thorn has a fight with some elite that's supposed to be important but isn't really, and the rest of Majestic save him. Halsey is taken by a teleporting Promethean, and Majestic act like they've never seen energy swords and cloaks before further proving that they don't deserve to be called Spartans. The captain talks with some generic evil admiral who orders him to kill Halsey. The bitch Palmer is all for it, making me wonder why the fuck she ever got her own game. Which was shit too. Halsey escapes the elites and makes contact with the librarian, who somehow knows all about Halsey because destiny. Fuck's sake. She gives Halsey the Janus key, which shows the location of all four on a tech in the galaxy. The Elite takes Halsey, but not before she throws half of the key to Thorn. The Elite has the other part, but it's not clear what exactly it can and cannot do alone, so I find myself not caring at all. Palmer and Majestic go for one artifact while Crimson goes for another. Somehow, the artifacts cause Requiem to move towards the Sun, the Infinity being dragged along with it. 
The artifacts are disabled and the Infinity escapes once the Spartans get back aboard. As for what Crimson is doing during most of this, I have no idea because I didn't play Season 2, and Season 1 was so boring and uninvolving I barely remember anything aside from the Elite Terrorist. So Halt is army severed and she seemingly sides with the Elite to get revenge, though it's most likely going to be her secretly sabotaging his efforts, or setting her up as an enemy for Chief in Halo 5 and 6, probably dying in his arms and reminding him of Cortana. If that does happen, remember, I called it first. So in conclusion, Spartan Ops was terrible. Even without the boring as hell gameplay dragging it out, I found myself not giving a fuck about the plot one bit. It somehow has a less interesting villain than the campaign, and he doesn't get killed, implying he'll come back in Halo 5, either a follow-up Spartan Ops or even in the main story. The characters are uninteresting and underdeveloped, and aside from some decent action and some gorgeous CGI, nothing about this entire mode is redeemable. Nor is it worth anyone's time to play or watch, and it's a fucking disgrace that this is what we lost firefight mode for. 343 had to achieve two things with this game. One, they had to introduce a new story and a new threat with presumably higher stakes in the original trilogy. Two, they had to prove that they were worthy of continuing this juggernaut franchise now that Bungie has left, and I just don't think they achieved either of those things. The new enemy is terrible, uninteresting troops and a boring generic leader. The story is dull and unmemorable with some of the dumbest decisions I've ever seen done with a sci-fi setting. All weapons other than precision weapons feel incredibly nerfed. All the new weapons are boring alternate versions of weapons that already exist aside from the pistol that fires grenades which is admittedly kinda cool, but the rest of the weapons have no satisfying impact and aren't fun to use. The multiplayer has no soul playing more like COD than Halo. The soundtrack is really generic, especially compared to Marty O'Donnell's very grandiose score to the previous games. In fact, most of the music I've used in this review has been from other games in the franchise. The Spartan Ops mode is atrocious in gameplay and story, and that we lost Firefight for this garbage is just icing on the shit cake. Now 343 has gained some goodwill through some of the devs acknowledging that the game wasn't that good, and the release of the Master Chief Collection, which is certainly more ambitious than Anniversary, if still rooted in the same problems. There's just nothing this game has going for it really, other than a good performance by Jen Taylor, some gorgeous CGI, and a general graphical improvement compared to Reach. Look, if you enjoy Halo 4, good for you. You know, go ahead, enjoy the game as much as you want. But all I want with this is for you to understand why this game was such a massive disappointment for me personally, a long time Halo fan, who just wants to see the series return to its former glory. And maybe it will with Halo 5, but after Halo 4, I won't hold my breath. And why does Chief need a cloak? He has power armor that can keep him alive in extreme environments, including outer space. What the fuck difference is a cloak going to make? 343 had to achieve two things with this game. One. Uh... Mm -hmm. uh. 